The problem with recording the intro after you've recorded the episode is that if you're me, your voice is ravaged by the time you get to it. So all I can say is Happy New Year, kids, and welcome back, and I'll see you on the other side. You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Billy Connolly did this bit one time. The great Billy Connolly, uh, probably my favorite comedian of all time, the big yin. Billy Connolly did this bit one time. It was at the beginning of one of his stand up specials, right? And he comes out on the stage and there's this awkward kind of moment where he's like, I don't know how, I don't like coming on. (laughs) I don't like coming on. I don't mind being on, staying on, no problem whatsoever. But coming on is awkward and difficult, you know? And Louis C.K. did something similar to that, too. It's like, why is anybody even list Like, the only thing you guys have in common, the audience, is that you're facing the same direction. <laughs> like, why is anybody even listening to me? And it's a weird thing. Now, I'm not Billy Connolly, and I'm not Louis C.K., all right? But there is an awkwardness right now in coming on, resuming the podcast. You know, it's a little bit like... This episode's going to be a little bit like a footballer, right? Like a soccer player, okay? Soccer player's out with an injury, you know, tears up his ankle, something like that. He's been out for a while, pulls a hammy. And then when he comes back, even if he's, you know, a regular first name on the team sheet starting 11 kind of guy, they don't bring him on for the full game, man. It's going to be like they'll bring him on for 60 minutes, take him off, you know, get his endurance back. Maybe they put him on the bench and he comes on for 25, 30 minutes at the end of the game. That's kind of this podcast, okay? Because I was out longer than I thought I would be, which is a little bit misleading because I wasn't sure how long I would be out. It was like mid-December when I did the last episode of the year and I left that hanging. Because I had to do some thinking, right? And I thought, I don't know, I might be back in a couple weeks. I might not be back at all. That's the reality, man. That's the reality in this game. But every now and again, I got to step back, take a look at how things are going. This is leadership, all right? Take a look at how things are going. And is it working? And what's the objective anyway? And so I kind of stepped away. A, you got to clear your head, which I did. There's a lot going on in the head. Very, very little of it is useful or worth talking about. But I had to kind of step away from the pod for a while. And then there's this big question that comes up, which is a bunch of big questions come up. One of them is, why are you doing this? And are you going to keep doing this? And what's the point anyways? And there are times when I go down a serious philosophical existential rabbit hole, you know? And it's very easy in the podcast world to get wrapped up in all of the best practices, right? And I'm I'm the sort of person who is influenced by that. So you go to, you know, you read the experts, air quotes, talking about what your podcast has to be and how it has to work and how you can't get away with doing this or doing that. You know, you can't be a Bill Burr. You can't even be a Joe Rogan anymore. You know what I mean? You can't do things the way other people... Like, there's got to be... There's like six formulas for how a podcast can be if you want it to be successful, right? According, again, to the air quote experts. And I am a person who gets very influenced by that. I get wrapped up in that sort of thing. And... I begin very seriously to doubt and question my own direction when I see advice from the experts that suggests that's the wrong direction. And then I had to think about 
What's the goal here? And I will confess to you, now that we're in February of 2022, I'll confess, you know, when I started the show, I was hoping that the show would become a thing. And I still hold a certain degree of hope that the show will become a thing. But when you go read the experts and you start sort of pigeonholing yourself into what the experts say you got to do, what you can do, what you can't do, for example, just come on as a solo podcaster and ramble away like this. Some people like rambling, all right? I happen to enjoy rambling. And the thing is, you can pigeon yourself into the box, pigeonhole yourself into the box all you like, but if what you're pigeonholing don't resonate with you, it just ain't going to work, man. And so I had to go through this all the time. It's like, well, I like to get on the microphone sometimes and just talk. And then I get it sort of from a couple of different sides because my internal critic says, dude, nobody wants to hear what you have to say. How dare you have the arrogance and audacity <laughs> to sit down and hit record and put that into the world? And that part of me is not wrong. And I feel that almost every time I sit down here. It's like, what is this arrogance? But then another part of me that's maybe a bit more forgiving, maybe a bit more elevated, stops and says, you know what? If you have the impetus to do this, if this is in you to do, then maybe that's divinely planted, man. You know, maybe there is something in you that needs expressing that somebody out there benefits from. And, you know, you can sit back and say you want to meet all these metrics and you want the podcast to turn into a thing, and there ain't nothing wrong with success, okay? I have mental problems with that, <laughs> but there ain't nothing wrong with success. But sometimes you just have to bring the bar down a little bit and say, you know, maybe if somebody out there benefits from the sound of my voice, words have power, you know? Or somebody benefits from me waffling here like this, maybe then it's worth doing. And maybe if it's in me to do that, it feeds the both of us, you know? And so I sat back over the holidays thinking about this kind of direction. And what do I do and why and what's it all for? And that's why, one of the reasons why, there was a longer holiday break than I expected. <laughs> I put, it may not seem like it, but I do put a certain amount of pressure on this podcast to be a thing. And I have to accept that my definition of a thing might not be realistic or might not be appropriate. It might be, it might not be, but at a certain point, you probably have to let go of that stuff and just do it or not do it. You know, and so I sat for several weeks thinking about doing it and not not really having the gumption and the impetus to sit down and do it. And I'll tell you a little secret that becomes a real catalyst for depression. OK, <laughs> you know, if you're a person who's inclined to create, even if what you create isn't all that good or doesn't meet the industry standard, whatever that is, whoever decides that for their own benefit. You know, if you have this impetus to create and you don't use it, that impetus sort of folds in on itself. It goes inside and it creates dis-ease, man. And so it was with me. And over the last little while, I've had this sort of awful feeling inside probably to do with not expressing in some way, not creating in some way, because, you know, no matter what, creation is a release, and creation provides a platform for hope. Hope is a powerful thing, just ask Barack Obama, all right? And so you sit there not creating, <laughs> and the impetus folds in on you, begins to work at your insides, and you lose a sense of hope, and you lose a sense of release, that ain't okay, man. And so this was beginning to catch up to me. But all the time, you know, in the back of my head, it's like, well, yeah, but the podcast can't work unless it's this. And the podcast has to have this. And don't you know you're supposed to be some sort of spiritual person, and it's got to be derived from this great motivation 
to help and serve people. Holy pressure, man. Sometimes the best service is simply to express what's in you, man. (laughs) And if you're like me, and you've been off for a while, and your voice isn't in shape anymore, oh yeah, it takes some endurance, man. And you've got the podcasting equivalent of a pulled hammy. Sometimes you just come in and do like the 30 minute at the end of the game, or maybe you start and come off at the hour mark. You know, get yourself back in shape. So that's what I'm doing. I'm dropping in right now to let you know that I'm still here. I've been working through some stuff, been working through some directions, but I'm still here. We haven't gone away. I took an extended break and I'm allowed to do that because it's my show, all right? And I'm still doing this voice. That just seems like I have it now. It's like it's the natural thing that comes out of me. I don't know if I'll keep doing this voice or not, all right? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but I suspect some things are going to change on the show. And one of the things which will be especially satisfying to those of you who don't like this voice is that I'm probably going to reintroduce some different voices, okay? The original aim of this program, I might even change the name. I don't know. I might. The original intent of this show, the original direction of this show, was conversations with cool people. You remember that? Danny Gauthier's hand-drawn art, the John Huff podcast, conversations with cool people. That's where we began. The first, whatever it was, 30 or 40 episodes were interviews, were conversations with cool people doing interesting things as a vehicle for inspiration, man. Lately, I'm thinking... Maybe we ought to talk to some more people. So I got a couple irons in the fire. I may have some guests coming on. You know, we're going to turn this into a little bit of a free-for-all, man. I think that's the direction we're going. So once in a while, maybe you'll get a superficial history. Once in a while, maybe you'll get your humble host just rambling like this and hoping it's okay. Sometimes guests, you know, we'll still talk about the music. We'll still talk about what's going on. But I'm getting away, or at least attempting to get away from the metrics and getting away from the box that the experts say your podcast has to be in, getting away from this notion of the thing being a thing and just sort of seeing what wants to be expressed, becoming a conduit. If you are a creator of any sort, You've probably experienced that flow state, right? This sense of being a conduit. Have you ever written a song? I know a lot of you out there who listen to my show are music lovers and musicians, and you've written songs. And these did not come from your head, man. These were expressed through you. I have had this experience as a writer many, many, many times where I've sat down for a writing session or I've written through the whole thing and then three months or six months or a year later, I go back and I look at what was written and I'm like, I have no memory of writing this. I had this experience during my little hiatus. I went back, I was thinking about, you know, redeveloping the writing muscle, maybe digging back into that. My impetus before music was writing. I spent 10, 12, 13, occasionally really great and often very, very difficult years trying to be a fiction writer. And so I went back on my little hiatus, kind of searching for a spark, you know? And I went back and I looked at some stuff that I had written a decade ago, whatever, and I laughed my ass off a couple of times. You're allowed to laugh at your own work, especially if you have so much distance from it now that it doesn't feel like your work anymore. (laughs) So I laughed at a couple of things, you know, but I'm like, I didn't, I don't remember writing this. Even at the time, you become a conduit, man. And that is how creativity works. It is not, especially in the initial creation phase, it is not a head thing, right? It is a gut thing. It is a heart thing. And if you're like me, though, your head dominates everything. And that's a bad, bad idea, man, because my head sucks. My head is a nightmare. My head should not be given responsibility for creating much of anything, all right? The creation part has to come from inside. The editing part can come from your head, 
All right, your brain, your ego, those faculties are very useful. You need them. And I don't know how that, you know, how that applies to this podcast thing because I would do some editing. Yeah. But it's not the same as editing a piece of writing. I mean, this is coming out and going out. And I don't know where the head comes in here. Maybe in the initial idea planning kind of phase, but when it comes to actually expressing, you got to let that come through you, man. I have not been great at that. And then in the last five or six weeks, I've been all wrapped up in my head about what this should be instead of wrapped up in my gut, wrapped up in my heart, wrapped up in that solar plexus chakra (laughs) about what this ought to be. And what it ought to be is whatever the impulse says it should be. And if that does not match what the industry says it has to be, and if that means it doesn't become a thing on that kind of level you hope for, so be it, man. But what I have learned in observing other people is that when you do your thing and you allow that to come through you and you do it by the impetus, even if it's not what the industry says it has to be, it somehow finds a way. Have you ever noticed that? It's the avant-garde stuff. This is not (laughs) avant-garde. This is a dude talking into a microphone. This is basic podcasting 101, all right? This is how it used to be. This is retro. (laughs) But those people who kind of paint outside the lines, somehow it tends to find a way. And so you have to check your motivation sometimes. I had to check mine. I continue to have to check it. What is this about? You know, and it's, it's tempting to be kind of elevated. It's about serving people. And it is. But sometimes the highest service to people is not delivered with that sort of goal in mind. The object is to, you know, show up as you are, deliver what is in you to be delivered. Yes, it's an act of service, but really it's just an act of expression. And then it serves who it serves, man. And it accomplishes what it accomplishes. And if it feels good to you to do it, if it's useful to you to express it, if it's in you to do, then you're probably meant to do it, man, to whatever end. And so I've had to ping pong around going crazy about what I'm doing here and why. And in the end, it doesn't help, man. It does not serve you. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be critical, and that doesn't mean you don't step back and strategize. I haven't done that. But it doesn't mean you don't. But when you get all wrapped up in your head and what it has to be, the life and the fun goes out of things. And I've become a little bit frightened to be out there. It's the legacy of this whole COVID thing and anxiety and all that stuff. I've been a little bit intimidated by that. And that's another thing I got to work through, you know? Being out here in this way can feel very egoic. But if you flip it, and if you look it around and say you have the impulse and the impetus to do this, then it is not egoic to do it. To do it and release it is an act of service, man. It is putting something into the world that maybe has some value to somebody. And it can feel egoic. And if you're like me and you're paranoid about that sort of thing, you've really become sensitive about it. And I have, and I got to work through it, okay? And I'm in the process of doing that, but I'm just here to tell you I'm still here. (laughs) Took a long break, because why not? Probably going to bring in some guests, get some different voices going, have some conversations, have a little fun, all right? And we're just going to push forward and see what happens from here, all right? But it's 2022. And they canceled the War on Drugs shows in Toronto, man. And that frustrates me. Not surprised. All right. They made the announcement sometime in December, I want to say. And we knew, right? We knew that was going to happen because the lockdown-ish situation resumed. Omicron, here we go again. I don't know what I'm allowed to say. I don't know if I'm allowed to say the O word or the C word. (laughs) So I might get shut down, they might go all Rogan on me, and I don't want that to happen. Uh, But we knew it was coming. You held on hope, but those shows in February are canceled, and it hurts, man, cools my cockles. 
But you can go on the YouTube. They actually refunded the money. All right. So, you know, thank goodness for that. Thank dog for that, as Blind Boy might say. <laughs> I got the money back, which is nice, but I'm not going to get to see the war on drugs, at least not right away. And that bothers me because I love that band so much. But you can go on the YouTube. You can see footage from their current tour. They're playing the new record. It sounds incredible. You guitar players, go look at Adam Grandisil, all right? He's the lead singer. He's the guy. Plays lead guitar mostly. And just go and watch some of the live footage from these shows and just look at his pedals. <laughs> he's got a whole ring of pedals that surround him. Now, Adam's whole thing is soundscapes, right? Like, it's all about tones. You know, I like tones, man. And his whole thing is about all these tones, different textures, different sonic sort of vibes. Need a lot of gear to make that happen. And he's got it, man. He is surrounded by pedals. But the new record sounds incredible live. It sounds incredible as a record too, by the way. I don't live here anymore. Would have been my record of the year last year. And the title track was my song of the year if you listened to the last episode. Go watch some of the War on Drugs stuff live. I hope I get a chance. I hope I get a chance. Like, I don't know what the deal is. Feels like we're on the edge here. <laughs> we got the truckers rallying in Ottawa and what whatever's going on there. And it feels like we're at a kind of a breaking point where we probably got to open things up and leave them open to whatever ends, you know? And I don't know what's going to happen with that. And I don't know if War on Drugs will reschedule and hopefully turn up in Toronto later this year. I would like that very much because I want to see them, man. One of the things that I did over the course of the holiday is I really dug into watching concerts on the YouTube, right? And I went back in time and I watched a Queensryche show from like 1992, let's say. I think it was 1992 in Toronto. They were on the Empire Tour and I'm pretty sure my pal Steve was at that show. This is peak Queensryche, all right? 1992, touring on Empire. So they play the Empire stuff, and then they play some older stuff, and, like, that's a show. That's a show right there. And then there's, like, a little set change, and they do the entire Operation Mindcrime CD front to back. Whoa. This is, like, a two-and-a-half-hour show, man. And unreal. And the, the Queensryche gig was amazing, and I just watched the whole thing. I, you know, it popped up on my YouTube and I thought, all right, I'll watch for a few minutes. I'm not doing anything. Watch the whole dang thing front to back. And that band in that moment was absolutely freaking sublime. You want your mind blown, right? You want your hair blown back. You want your cockles warmed. Go to the YouTube, put in Queensryche. I think it's Toronto 1992 full show. Sit back, turn it up loud on your smart TV with your home audio theater surround sound system. Just watch and listen to that, man. Holy crap! What a band. Those two albums, Mind Crime and Empire, peak stuff, man. Terrific records. Heavy, moody, technically just mind-blowing. And they're just hitting it. Oh, man, Jeff Tate is in peak form and just crushing it, hitting those notes. And his performance is really amazing, especially on the Mind Crime, because that is a concept record where Jeff Tate basically plays the title character or the lead character of this kind of assassin pulled into a conspiracy, right, to kill important people. And so he's performing this role throughout the whole thing. It's like a freaking musical, right? Incredibly anguished and angry and evocative and expressive performance. And this is like a two and a half hour show, man. Most of us would do that gig. And that's like we don't play again for two months. <laughs> he was playing again somewhere the next night. Like it's technique, it's vocal power. It's incredibly like he must have been in terrific shape to do that. And to be that expressive, and he's rolling around on the stage, and he's anguished, and they got, like, the song Sweet Sister Mary, and they got the girl on the screen singing back and forth with him. Really, really powerful stuff. Tremendous show. Queensryche, Toronto, 1992, and I watched that. 
And then I watched a bunch of live King's X. Anytime I watch live anything, I always wind up watching live King's X because they're my guys, my favorite band, man. It warms my cockles. And I never got to see King's X in the real heyday. And that's where I'm going with this war on drugs thing, man, because they canceled the shows. And I want to see the war on drugs at peak, you know? I know I've got time still, but I want to see them at peak because I missed so many bands at peak. I didn't see Queensryche at peak. I didn't even see King's X at peak because it was a different time. All right. And their peak, I was like a teenager, early 20s, and they didn't come around to Toronto that much. They did come in, but I didn't hear about it. It was not Internet time. You know, I just missed it. I just never caught them at peak. And so I went back, and there's some incredible stuff. King's X, I know I'm biased, all right, but they are, were just an incredible live band, dude. Three-piece band, power trio, all the vocal harmonies, all the tones happening, no tracks, nothing, all performed live. And spotless. And in around 1990... They were on tour opening for ACDC, okay? Now, if you've not listened to King's X, don't make the mistake of thinking they're like ACDC. They're not. King's X is more of a prog band than anything and a proto-grunge band. A lot of grunge bands from the Seattle scene were big King's X fans before their bands popped. You know what I mean? Alice in Chains and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, all these bands were influenced by King's X. That is the kind of world they come from. They are an entity unto themselves. They never fit anywhere, which is one of the reasons why they never blew up like they probably deserved to. But they still got some chances, man, and they got some big tours, especially in the heyday, those first three or four records, 88 to around 92. One of those opportunities was opening for ACDC. So there's a show on YouTube from somewhere in Germany, like 1990. And it's their opening sets, maybe 30 or 40 minutes. And they are just freaking destroying, man. And my heart's just banging in my chest watching this because A, they are so good. And B, the crowd is so hostile. So people are like throwing things at them. You know, you'll see stuff bouncing off the stage bouncing off their heads, and they just push through, man, and they just play, and they crush it. They have this tune from the Faith Hope Love record called Moan Jam, which is just like an eight-minute Ty Tabor guitar solo, <laughs> and it just pounds, and they just play it, and they play all the tunes, and they just absolutely crush, and you can feel the crowd coming around. You know, midpoint later in the show, the crowd is coming around. There are still dicks who are throwing things. What is she doing, man? But you can sense the crowd coming around because this band is too good to ignore, okay? The musicianship is incredible. Doug's voice, incredible. Harmonies, incredible. And they're just crushing. And it is so gratifying. A, I was angry, but then by the end, it was so gratifying to see how hard they played, how well they played, and how they brought the crowd around. And there's another one, same tour, and it's in Florida. You can go look this up. You can watch the whole thing. Again, it's another 30, 40 minutes. Just crushing. And then I went and I watched one from 1994, okay? This is the Dogman Tour, and they are headlining someplace in New York. Pretty big room, and it's the full two-hour show. And you just watch it in amazement. Go into YouTube, King's X, 1994, New York, full show. And just sit back and watch a band absolutely crush. No tracks, no games, no gimmicks. Just three cats playing and pounding. And it just was so exciting to watch, man because I never got to see them at peak, and I never got to see so many of the bands I love at peak. 
partly because I was still in the Christian world and you didn't go to those shows, man, so I missed out as a late teen on seeing Poison and Cinderella and Motley Crue and all those bands that I loved so much. Didn't get to see them, you know, saw some of them later, post-peak, but I never got the real experience with the real energy, with those bands playing at their very best. And I want that with the war on drugs, all right? I saw it with Ghost. Thank goodness, a few years ago, I got to see Cardinal Copia and Ghost on the pale tour named Death. Thank goodness for that. I want to see the war on drugs when I get the chance, you know? So I hope they come back around. And I watched a Metallica show from last November thought, let's dare to compare, you know? And what's going on down there anyways? Seems like it's wide open and a free-for-all. So there's Metallica. I think it was the Atlanta show from November. You can go watch this too, the full show. And it was okay. But the one thing that I noticed, which really irritated me, is that it's like at a football stadium, right? So there's a whole crowd out in front of the stage. You know, you know how it is. You've been to shows, right? So there's all these people, the thousands, in front of the stage, and the camera angle that I was looking from was behind them, and it's just phones, man. Now, you don't need me to rail about phones at shows, but come on, man. I take a little clip. All right, I usually take a couple photos at the beginning of the gig, especially if it's Ghost and their set is so incredible that you need a photo to describe it to people. And I'll take a little video clip to have one. Okay. Guilty as charged. But I'm watching these folks by the thousands record the whole dang show on their phones and miss the whole thing. And I don't get it, man. I guess we've become so accustomed to cataloging our whole life, you know, making a photo or a video of freaking every dang thing we do for posterity. And who goes back and watches? Who goes back and watches the whole dang Metallica show? Take a clip if you want. Take it for the memories. Take it to say you were there. But literally, I watched. And it was just a sea of phones for the whole freaking show. And I'm like, you missed it. You missed it. Why? (laughs) This has become a thing for me because I'm trying real hard to just make memories, okay? Are we all afraid of death? Is that what it is? It's like we're afraid of losing these moments we had, these moments that are our lives, this collection of images that is our lives. Like anybody gives a crap about your collection of images. (laughs) You know, when I went to Europe in the fall, we were there for six weeks, and I, by my standards, took hardly any photographs at all. Mostly pictures of food to send back to my wife so she could see what was up. And, you know, a couple spots here and there that I don't look at. And... I've taken photos in the past because I was blogging and they add to the blog and they add to the story and whatever. But I'm very much endeavoring to take fewer photographs than I did. And I hardly posted any on social media. You know, I'm trying to internalize. I'm trying to make memories. And I'm just watching these people seeing Metallica recording the whole dang show. Is the game that you're going to put it on YouTube later and get a bunch of hits? Is that what you're there for? Because you're missing the experience, man. (laughs) You're missing the whole dang thing. And I found that very frustrating, you know? One of the kind of cool things about watching King's X 1994, watching the Queensryche gig, watching whatever, no phones, man. No phones at all. There may have been lighters that triggered sprinkler systems at the Maple Leaf Gardens. I don't know. But no phones. And that was really cool to see. Now, I've talked about the phones. I've talked about my own phone addiction. I've talked about social media. This ain't new for me. But just watching it on that scale was really something. And I don't know, man. Take a clip. Take a clip. That's all right. But the whole dang show? To what end? What are we doing? And why do we need the attention we think we'll get? From that, I don't understand. Maybe I'm just ancient now. Maybe I'm just too elderly to get the modern zeitgeist. Maybe I just don't get the kids, but I found that really irksome, all right? Metallica, whatever. I've, I like Metallica. I've never been the biggest Metallica fan. But hey, give them props, man. They're freaking Metallica. It was cool to watch their show. I dug it. 
I'm going to watch more live stuff probably. It was really, it was like this little rabbit hole. I had like this week long period over the holidays where it's just what I did. <laughs> I was taking a break from the podcast and everything else. It was cool to watch that. But go back, man. Go back, watch shows from the 80s, 90s. Really, really incredible stuff going on. Very, very cool. Now, my voice is starting to go because, you know, podcasting hammy. And I got I to gotta roll on soon. But I'm going to tell you this. Two new songs you go to need. You got to go and check out, all right? A, go listen to Call Me Little Sunshine by Ghost Man. New ghost! New ghost! Always a good thing when there's new ghost. I guess this is technically the second single from the forthcoming album, Impera. Impera? Impera? We'll say Impera. Sounds like a car, don't it? Yeah, man, I got a 2017 Impera. New ghost record, Impera, coming out. The song, Call Me Little Sunshine. This is interesting because that is a quote attributed to Aleister Crowley. Mr. Crowley, for all of you Aussie fans out there, right? Same cat. Aleister Crowley was a British guy born late 1800s, died mid-1940s. An infamous writer, hedonist, occultist, founded a religion called Thelema. Thelema, Thelema. Uh, Super into all the hedonistic stuff, and all the occult stuff and magic and all this sort of bizarre spirituality. Aleister Crowley, man, Mr. Crowley. Apparently, he's on the cover of the Sgt. Pepper's record as well, so go look that up. Aleister Crowley, many references in popular music. And so he was in court for, I'm not sure why, probably being an occultic hedonist, which is frowned upon, man. Now we just call him an influencer, but at the time he was in court and he identified himself as the Beast 666. Well, the powers that were took umbrage with this notion of calling yourself the Beast 666. And Aleister Crowley said, look, 666 just represents sunlight, man. So you may call me Little Sunshine. Now, if you look at the cover, the cover art for Impera, you have this sort of ghost. It's very like it's the new the new nameless ghouls outfits are very steampunk. It's pretty cool, actually. So if you look at the cover of the ghost record, it's like the skeleton guy, but it's all it's weirdly futuristic and steampunk at the same time. It's like metallic. And you see the skeleton the skeleton character that they have on all their covers. And he's got his hands by his cheeks sort of looking at you, and half of his face is kind of weird. And that is a take on a famous photograph of Aleister Crowley. All right, there's always these sort of layers of symbolism and stuff in Ghost's artwork and all that stuff. I don't know if I've talked much about my history with Ghost, and I probably will when the Impera record actually comes out, but I really dig their imagery, obviously, but I like the layers of mythology and I like just the fun they have with it. Ghost is very tongue-in-cheek, okay? It's all a gimmick, kids, all right? And they have a laugh with it and it's a lot of fun. And I, so I've read out there people hearing the new single, Call Me Little Sunshine, and saying, meh, it's okay. And I'm like, what is wrong with you people? The song is brilliant. <laughs> the song crushes man it's got this moodiness happening great riff a riff so good that i went onto the youtube because within hours of it being released there were already how to play this song guitar tutorials <laughs> that's how fast this stuff happens kids i went online and i'm like i want to learn it's not that tough i have just enough skill to maybe try to almost pull this off and i went and I had to drop tune my guitar a whole step. I had to learn how to do that. And then learn to play this tune. It was that good, man. And once you realize that Ghost plays everything tuned to step down, suddenly I'm messing about with Dance Macabre and Square Hammer. A lot of fun, man. You can have a lot of fun with the guitar, kids. I love Call Me Little Sunshine. I think it's a great song. I love the chorus. I love the moodiness in those verses. And Ghost always goes to weird melodic places, you know? There's always this sort of eerie undertone 
but at the same time, it's show tunes. It's weird 70s rock and roll show tunes, maybe more 80s now. The last album, Prequel, had a distinctly 80s hard rock vibe. This new song carries on that tradition, but it pulls in a little bit of the older kind of heaviness and just weird chord progressions, weird melodies. Tobias Forge, if he is genuinely writing all of this himself, is beyond a genius. He's a conduit, kids. He's not working within the box. But sometimes, when you let it come through you and you don't worry about the box, it finds a way. So I love the tune. Call me Little Sunshine. Go listen to it. I cannot wait. I can wait. But I'm stoked for the new Ghost record, Impera. I think it's going to be freaking awesome. There's some live stuff floating around now. Their tour started a couple weeks ago with Volbeat. We talked about that already. You can go online. You can go on the YouTube. You can see live stuff. Friend, Ghost Live is so great. And they got like nine or eight or nine people on stage now. Tobias is getting away from tracks as much as he can. So he's got singers on stage with him now. Like he's doing the whole thing and he's doing it right. And they are tremendous live. The show is theatrical. It's visual. It's funny. They're really funny. And very tongue-in-cheek. And the song's crush. And you can hear some of the new stuff from the record that's being played live. Go check it out. Ghost is awesome. Love the new song. Very much looking forward to the new record. And hope I get a chance to see Ghost on this tour somewhere. I heard something about Austria. And I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. One more. Ty Tabor, the great and powerful Ty Tabor, has a new record coming out. It is called Shades. Ty, as you know, is the lead guitar, well, the only guitar player in King's X, probably the most underrated rock guitar player of all time to fit in the most underrated rock and roll band of all time. Ty is mesmerizing. I've said before, I go to King's X shows and I line up right in front of him because I just want to watch that dude play guitar. Ty's also a great songwriter, has a very cool voice, very Beatles. You know, if you're into the Beatles, You should be checking out some of Ty's solo stuff. He has a new record coming out. It is called Shades. He is also a tone master for many, 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 many years. Ty hid his his setup. He hid his rig from view because he had a very unique way of achieving what was a very unique tone. People wanted to know what it was. It became like a hot topic in the underground. What the hell is Ty Tabor's guitar setup? What is he doing to get that tone? And he hid it for a long, long time. It has subsequently been revealed. But he's still a master of guitar tone. He dropped a new single. It is called Sister Genocide. It's uh, coming out on Rat Pack. So if you go to the Rat Pack Records account on YouTube, you can see and hear the lyric video for Ty Tabor's new song, Sister Genocide. Maybe we'll get Ty on, you know? I wouldn't mind having Ty on the show. Go listen to Ty Tabor's uh, solo stuff if you're into like good old fashioned just rock and roll with some tremendous guitar work because <laughs> that dude is a beast. My favorite Ty solo records are Rock Garden and Something's Coming. Go listen, go find them. They're probably on the Spotify. Rock Garden, Something's Coming, and get yourself ready for the new album Shades. Go listen to Sister Genocide. Love me some Ty Tabor, my favorite musician on planet Earth, my friends. There's more I was going to say, but I'm not going to say it now. Our old pal Deuce tipped me off to the Netflix show Formula One Drive to Survive. And I've become semi-obsessed with that program. It is a docuseries about the life and times on the Formula One circuit. Now, I kind of think car racing is stupid and I don't really get it. But this program is absolutely fascinating, okay? Getting inside the personalities, the way Formula One works, the chaos that happens, the money that's involved. Formula One is a thing, man. People, particularly in other parts of the world, go crazy for this stuff. And I don't really get it, but I am fascinated by this program. So if you're looking for something to watch on Netflix that you might not have tried out before, don't gotta be a racing fan to dig Formula One Drive to Survive, okay? One more thing. Justin Hawkins rides again. Justin Hawkins is the voice of the darkness. I believe in a thing called love. Get your hands off my woman, mother... Okay. 
Justin Hawkins Rides Again is a YouTube series. Justin Hawkins has a YouTube channel where he does 10, 20, 30 minute song breakdowns, talks about what's going on in music, gets out his guitar and plays stuff. Dude's a great guitar player and I didn't even realize that. And I really like The Darkness, by the way. We have a connection to that band because our old pal Emily Dolan Davis was interviewed on this program and she was for a year or so in The Darkness as the drummer. Got some insight on that band from her. Anyways, very interesting YouTube show. Justin Hawkins rides again. Talks about a lot of cool stuff, a lot of fun stuff. Talked about Ghost on a recent episode, and he dug it. So if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me, man. Go watch that. Watch the Formula One. Listen to Ty Tabor. Listen to Ghost. Get ready for some new records. And get ready for whatever on earth (laughs) is going to happen on this program, all right? I'm going to go for now because my voice is ravaged and I got places to be, believe it or not. I hope you enjoyed your holidays. I hope you are having a good 2022 so far. Been a bit rocky for your boy over here, but hopefully, um, you know, grounding that into some sort of balance. I'm going to shut up shutting up. We'll see what the future holds, kids. Until then, I'll check you later. Yeah. Call me little sunshine.